Good morning, honorable members, members of staff, and members of the gallery. I do apologize for the speaker, the honorable Michael Perkins, who will be joining us later this morning. With that regards, please be seated, house with you. I recognize the Honorable Eugene Hamilton, member for Chris St. Christopher, number eight. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I intended to use the lectern, but I recall something which happened a few days ago, which went something like whether someone is reading their presentation or not. So I put the lectern down. I put the lectern down because, Ms. Madam Deputy Speaker, I want to make this presentation hopefully in two parts. The first part I want to rebut some of the points made by the opposition in this parliament, which are outrageous. And the second part, of course, is to speak to my ministries, how they functioned in 2020, and perhaps even back in 2019, and what we are proposing for 2021. But before going into that substantive part of my presentation, Madam Deputy Speaker, I want to congratulate the those who gave their maiden speeches in their new capacity on this side of the house. I think they did a wonderful job and it shows that the future of the Team Unity government is bright. I am particularly impressed with how they energized this parliament when they spoke. And I believe, Madam Deputy Speaker, when I retire, I have nothing to worry about. What you said, Yanova Mark Bentley? <laughs> Proverbs, 8, Proverbs 18, 2. It says that a fool finds no pleasure in understanding, but delight in hearing his opinion. And we had a lot of that in this parliament. People who found no pleasure in trying to understand what the budget was about, even after 20 and 25 years of being in government. But just delight in speaking their twisted opinion. And so I go back to Soren Cook and Gerd, who said, there are two ways to be fooled. One is to believe what isn't true, and the other is to continue to believe what is not true. Let me repeat that. One is to repeat is to believe what isn't true, and the other is to refuse to believe what is true. Having said that, Madam Deputy Speaker, this robust budget that we have been having for the last few days. <clears throat> we'll conclude today and I want to make two bold statements at the outset. One is the state of our nation is strong. Madam Deputy Speaker, the state of our nation is safer. We promise a safer, stronger future. And I feel confident to stand today and to repeat what I just said. The state of our nation is stronger. The state of our nation is safer. What makes our nation safer, Madam Deputy Speaker? I can speak about a little of things, but I will just focus on two things. 
Let us take crime reduction. Anyone with any sense of reason can agree that crime in this nation has plummeted because of the stewardship of the TV unity government. We used to be called the murder capital of the world. We decided to spend the country's resources on providing second chances. Second chances to those who were otherwise feeling as if they were left out of the equation. We spent our country's resources providing employment. Employment to those who said they could not find employment. We created opportunities. We spent our resources providing them with opportunity to start their own businesses. Second chances, employment, new businesses. That together with other things, resulted in a, a drastic reduction in the homicide rate in St. Kitts and Nevis, especially when we talk about gun-related homicides. I was so pleased to hear the leader of the opposition in this parliament had to admit that he was pleased with the performance of the government in how it dealt with crime. Because I well recall that at one point when the leader of the opposition was in government, his response to questions of crime was, he don't take no responsibility for crime. These things, what they're saying, will just run off his back like a like water off a duck's back. But today I'm pleased that he could say that he is satisfied, he's pleased with the state of crime in our nation. And the second reason I will posit why our nation is safer is just looking at how we dealt with COVID-19. Compared to the rest of the region and the world, St. Kitts and Nevis has handled this crisis in such a way that the rest of the world can learn from us. We, of course, Madam Deputy Speaker, demonstrated leadership and governance and competence. What we have done is sought after by many nations around the world. Many of us in this country and outside have followed the COVID briefings. And you have listened to our debates so far in this house. And I know, and you know, those of you who are, have consciences. You see, a lot of people don't have no conscience, you know, Madam Deputy Speaker. And what you have to understand that the conscience in you is the God inside of you. And when you lose that God inside of you, you ain't got no conscience. And so those with consciences will know that the state of our nation is strong. The state of our nation is safe. What makes the nation strong? I just pointed out to you two reasons. Two things to point to why the nation is safe. But what makes the nation strong? Madam Deputy Speaker, our nation is strong because we have seen how this Team Unity Administration has managed the fiscal affairs of the country. The prudence with which we exercised our responsibility. Despite all of the global crisis causing airlifts and our ships not to come to our shores with passengers, drastically reducing our level of income. Up to this point, yes, it is true in the budget, it says we may have to. We did not go to borrow money to drive up the national debt like the previous administration. We handled our affairs well. And that tells us that the state of our nation is strong. And God in this vessel with us, We'll go to 2021, and you will see the administration perform in this COVID period as we get out of it, hopefully, demonstrating how strong we are. The tourism sector, Mr. Madam Deputy Speaker, 
is parked up with its ignition turned off. We are estimating that our revenue will be more than $150 million less than what was projected in 2019. And yet, Madam Deputy Speaker, we are at this point, even after giving $120 million stimulus, still in a position to continue to pay all of our public servants, to provide all of the services that we normally provide. And on the government side, there have been no retrenchment. Yes, Madam Deputy Speaker, the state of our nation is strong. So let's agree, Madam Deputy Speaker, let us agree all. The nation is safer. The nation is stronger. It is what we promised the people of St. Kitts and Nevis. It is what we said to them when we were going into the election of 2020. And it is what gave us a resounding victory at the polls. So, the people know that the state of our nation is safer. The state of our nation is stronger. Having made the case, Mr. Madam Deputy Speaker, that the state of the nation is safer and the state of the nation is stronger, I want to turn to a couple of things spoken by the opposition. They must be rebutted. One of the things said on the opposition benches was, the elections are behind us. I accept we have to move on. Really? Really, Madam Deputy Speaker? Really, Mr. Leader of the Opposition? Well, if that be so, how then do you support the fact that at the end of six months, a member of your team could bring a criminal matter in court against a sitting parliamentary member to try to unseat him? That is what I call sore leadership. Sore losers as well, engaging in an abusive process. And then come in the parliament to make statements like, the elections are behind us. I accept we have to move on. So losers, that's what we have. So losers who don't want St. Peter's to get its health center. Its first class health center which is being constructed, they don't want St. Peter's to get its health center. So losers who do not want the people in Stapleton to get their housing, their townhouses, some with the three bedroom for the first time. So losers do not want the people in Connery to get their bleachers on the play field. So losers, so hungry for power that they cannot help themselves. But I say to them, those who are so losers, the next go round, you will lose again in this country. The second point I want to refer to, Madam Deputy Speaker, that was spoken about here was matters to do with the Social Security. Social Security don't belong to the government. Paying out the money is wrong in law. What happened, Mr. Speaker? You mean the opposition don't want to see poor people get nothing? The opposition realizing that poor people, people who are out of jobs, got $1,000 a month for three months, something rough. They don't want him to get nothing. Social Security belongs to the people. And the people, people, you see, there's a feeling by some people that this is the government and that is the people. If the people make this government, you know, we are here because of the people. So when we make a decision, we make a decision on behalf of the people and the people agree with that. Over 8,000 people, Madam Deputy Speaker, were out of work, no income, nothing. And the, the Social Security responded by supporting the government's initiative, ensuring that people had what we call COVID relief. There is no law, Madam Deputy Speaker, that is broken here. If those in the opposition 
had asked the leaders, the leader of the opposition, to do his job, he would not be making such statements in this parliament because as leader of the opposition, he is the chairman of the Public Accounts Committee. As chairman of the Public Accounts Committee, he has access to every document if he wants to, to look at, to scrutinize. That is such a favored position. And yet, come into this parliament to ask questions as if he's some novice or little child. I am saying to you, Madam Deputy Speaker, it is not wrong in law. The leader of the opposition is handsomely paid, you know. He is paid by the people, the taxpayers of this country to do his job. He can't come to parliament and want us to do his job for him. He must do his job by pulling together the Public Accounts Committee and conducting himself as the chairman he's supposed to be. And then he wouldn't have to come here and ask about this. What is illegal, Madam Deputy Speaker, with your permission? I will turn to an opinion, the legal opinion, written to the Director of Social Security on the 4th of February 2020. With your permission, I will read. And I would not venture to read the entire document, but here is what it says. The National Provident Fund Act, which was the predecessor for the Social Security Act, was repealed when the latter piece of legislation was enacted. In making the transition from NFP to Social Security, the assets and liabilities of NFP were transferred to Social Security Fund, meaning the Social Security Board took possession and control of the assets of NPF, but also took responsibility for its liabilities. In the member's account, In the accounts of Social Security, the NFP was required to be constituted or recorded in two ways. One, by members' accounts, which refer to the amount paid by the members, and the interest it earned, that would make up one account. And the reserves, which reflected the fines and penalties collected under the NPF Act and any unallocated sums. So there were two accounts, Madam Deputy Speaker, one which has the members' ones, plus whatever interest it earns, and the other which had things like late fines and penalties and collections and, and reserves, two separate funds. The total there was somewhere in the vicinity of $30 million, 2.6 members account, two point, and, and 27 point something mem on, on the reserves account. So the decision, and I go on. Let me go to the final thing because I don't want to spend the, the whole thing. The funds can be used in accordance with the Social Security, Social Security Boards. The boards, not cabinet. The board makes the decision about these funds. And they could make the decision because they, those are the ones which are, we do not need a cabinet or parliamentary approval. They can use these funds to do what they want. And I'll tell you something, Madam Deputy Speaker. They used it. To put money in the economy, individuals with a thousand dollars a month, with a 90 or so percent propensity to spend, gonna spend 90 percent day, and that will have a multiplier, a ripple effect in the economy. It's an economic charger. That's what it is. Unlike what happened before under the previous administration, this approach helps to fuel economic activity keeps the country running good. That's what it did. Rather than the country to drip, drip, drip and shut down economically. So it is a good decision made by the Social Security Board to, to use those funds to trigger economic activity. Unlike the previous administration, this is how they dealt with Social Security. I am reading, Madam Deputy Speaker, from the financial statements for the year ending December 2018, which I tabled in this parliament a few months ago, maybe about a month and a half ago. Here's what it says. This is how they handled Social Security. At page 41, a number of government debts were restructured from 2012 
to 2014. It goes on. There was in St. Kitts and in Nevis government bonds. One of them was a 10-year bond with interest rate of 7.5%. Social Security earning 7.5% on that bond. The other one was a 12-year bond. I didn't tell you the figure of that bond. The one was 26 million, 688,000. The other one was a 12-year bond, $15 million, earning interest of 8.5%. Now, 107 and a half, 108 and a half. What do you think the government do, did at that time? This is what they did. They merged the two bonds together. Remember I told you a 10-year bond and a 12-year bond. Hmm? They merged them together as part of this debt relief thing, what they were doing. And they put the interest rate on the two, let me give you the figure, $41,572,610. The two combined and reduced the interest rate to 1.5%. Wow. You understand what I'm telling you, Madam Deputy Speaker? That is like ripping the pulmonary artery and the superior vena cava out of the social security. <laughs> I mean, that is how they dealt with social security. You know? Compared to us saying, give every man 8,000 people a thousand dollars a month and let them spend the money and let it multiply. These guys rip out the heart out of Social Security in 2012, 2013, 2014. It goes on, Madam Deputy Speaker, as if that was not bad enough. On the NIA side, they did a similar thing. Let me read it exactly. Four loans in Nevis, totaled in 26.9 million, will be structured, resulting in a lost provision of 9.3 million. It was all part of the plan for the debt swap, the, the trying to get rid of the debt. The 200 and something, almost 200% debt, where they keep boasting about coming down to 60%. That's how they did it. Deceptive. They like to talk about deceptive, you know. But this is how they did it. Just copy paper it over. It goes on on page 42, Madam Deputy Speaker. St. Kitts and Nevis government that continued. The Senate Statutory Corporations, that is the Social Security, had lent them money. Listen to what happened to those monies. On August 15, 2014, the Social Security Board and the Development Bank of St. Kitts and Nevis signed an agreement to give effect to the restructuring of eight loans. These restructured loans, including approving just total $45.9 million. At the same time, a few months later, on the 11th of November 2014, the Social Security Board and the National Housing Corporation signed an agreement to give effect to restructuring five loans. Eight and five, 13 loans. Restructuring amount was $133.6 million. You know what happened as a result of the restructuring, Madam Deputy Speaker, listen here. The loans in question were discounted, resulting in a total loss provision of $40.5 million. You hear what I tell you? These are figures I'm not making up. These are not lies. This is an audited statement of the Social Security tabled in this parliament. That is how they treated the money, the people's money they're talking about. $40.5 million. And these losses, it was so bad in 2014, they didn't, Social Security was even afraid to do the adjustment in 2014. You know when they did the adjustment? 2018. They did it in 2018. I won't go into all of the loans, they're here. But I want to turn to another document here, Madam Deputy Speaker. Prepared in 2014, just to underscore the point of what was happening when the 
the previous administration was trying to deal with this debt. This reads, it was written in 2014, August the 7th, by the Chief Financial Officer. It says here in the very first paragraph, on April 12, 2013, the Social Security Credit Board signed an agreement to give effect to the restructuring of four loans to a Nevis. Uh, 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 let, me, let me read it again. Four loans, two to the Nevis Island Administration, NIA, and two to the Nevis Land and House Corporation. So six loans for Nevis. Now the second paragraph says, the Social Security Board agreed in principle to propose the structure of either debt. However, there is a matter pertaining to the civil servant's mortgage loan that is managed by the Sinkis Development Bank and Sinkis, in Sinkis Nevis, which is being negotiated. The board has since agreed to proceed with the restructuring of this loan. There are 17 debts related to St. Kitts and Nevis government and statutory bodies, St. Kitts only, uh, to be restructured on in agreement. So 17 loans. So I put the two together, some 25 facilities restructured. I want to go to where the rubber meets the road. Let me go to page, this page. Here's what it says. The present value of the total restructured portfolio is $162,635,284.02. And the total impairment loss is $63,662,099.10. A 28 percent loss in 2014 this is what the thing that the cfo was writing advising the government what you're doing is going to cost the corporation 60 63 million dollars and you laugh when i say they report the heart they report the pulmonary and the superior vena cava you only laugh but it's true that's what they did that's what they did so they can't come to talk in here about how people treated Social Security. I am the Minister of Social Security and have a responsibility to help rebuild it back. And I tell you what, at some point, Madam Deputy Speaker, Social Security was projected, its, it's, it's um, depletion was projected in 2052. You know where it is now, Madam Deputy Speaker? In 2030 something, a few years from now, because of what the government has done to the Social Security. The depletion of the funds which was slated to be done by 2052 will be depleted in 2036 and it's going down because you realize in 2018 we're still adjusting loans from 2014. We have an opportunity now to make sure that we chart the course to rebuild the social security because many people in this country, many people have no other income but that of the social security. That from Social Security. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, when they talk about Social Security, they must look at their own history. Because their history is a sordid one. One that is not easy. And I started talking about Beacon Heights and so you know. Remember, I ain't talking anything about Beacon Heights and the hundred million dollars spent up there. I ain't talking about that yet. And some of the other lands. I haven't spoken about the land up in Fountain, you know, for 17 million dollars, you know which is just a gut. I haven't spoken about that yet. Ripping the heart out of Social Security. You understand? And come talking about poor people getting a thousand dollars. It's a thousand dollars for poor people to get. It ain't even enough. It ain't even enough. Madam Deputy Speaker, They talk about reducing debt to GDP. They reduce debt to GDP. About land. Land talk. That should not be tolerated in this parliament from members of the opposite position, you know. But it's land talk, Madam, De <laughs> Madam Deputy Speaker. It pains me when I hear this thing about land talk. Talking about land. These people poof away with land. I could spend three months talking about land. They poop over the land. Bradshaw, 
Madam Deputy Speaker, His Excellency. In 1975, was one of the architects, perhaps the principal architect, in the land acquisition, land which was owned by former estate sugar workers, sugar estate owners. And what he offered them, they did not accept. It lingered for years from 75 to mid 80s, when Simmons, His Excellency, decided to pay for the land, $22 million. Madam Deputy Speaker, if you go back and add up the figures that Don make from land was selling St. Kitts by the government, is more than 14 or 15 times $22 million. That investment of $22 million had been made so many times over. Decisions made by Bradshaw, then Simmons. Up comes the third prime minister. Poof it away. Poof. The land gone. With the land gone, Madam Deputy Speaker, what that means, Madam Deputy Speaker, you have a house. Hmm? You have a house. You go in New York to spend 20 years. You tell Dr. Douglas or the member for number three, look after my house for me. You ain't owe nobody for your house, you know. Look after me house. He take the house. You come back 20 years later. If you want your house, you gotta buy it back, you know. That's what happened here, you know. The free house, the, the unencumbered house that you gave him, now you come back and want your house, you got to pay. You have paid for the house. Because when you put the land for the debt, swap it. That is buying it again. And worse, if you want to own a piece of it, you got to buy it still. That's what happened here, you know. You, you, you put it simply because the people on the street will want to understand. Like I say, if you have a house, hmm, tell a man look after it, you go and when you come back, you got to buy it back. That's what happened here. Look, listen to this agreement. If you think they're joking, listen to this agreement with National Bank. This is how they poof away your land. There was, they had O National Bank. SSMC and O National Bank changed around $48.5 million. Couldn't pay. Frigibe Development Corporation, $31.1 million. Couldn't pay. La Valle Greens, $85.3 million. I paused there for a while because La Valle Greens just come. At least SSMC was there a long time. Hmm? Freaky Bay Development was there a long time too. But look at the Greens. We had $85 million gone. You all see $85 million gone in La Valle Greens? $85 million wipe out in the debt. So somebody, somewhere, some people got with the money and you pay for it. We paid for it. It's here, not making it up. $85 million. The Accountant General had 16. Another, another account for the Accountant General had 44 million. Another account for SSMC, 39 million. Scasper, 93. Over 750, so about $750 million is what they had on National Bank in 2012, 2013, 2014, couldn't pay. And they take the land now, and they say, National Bank here's the land. The problem is, the banking that prohibits National Bank from holding on to fixed assets like that, you've got to liquidate. So they form something they call a vehicle. Hmm? Put it over here. And they, 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 they deceived you by saying, this is here, it ain't really gone from the government, you know. The government still have something to do with it. But selling it so that National Bank can get its money. Because if not, the central bank will squeeze National Bank's throat. So your land, the free house where you left him, the free house I'm talking about you left him, is being sold to pay off the debt. That's what was done by the previous administration. Now, so when they're talking about land, they must look at their own history with land. 
Look at their own history. Madam Deputy Speaker, let me see if I could help to clarify this a bit more. Because you see, Madam Deputy Speaker, they're talking about land. This is part, listen, listen to this agreement here, Madam Deputy Speaker. See the land here? Three hundred and thirty one point nine nine acres. Right? Which was at Cranston. Lindsay Grant, you know that? 164.3 acres. Another piece down Cranston. Yeah, so between those two, that's 495, 96 acres. Another 28.3 Frigate Bay Development Corporation. Then a portion of land belong to Ponzi State, another portion belong to Ponzi State, a third portion belong to Ponzi State, a piece of Douglas Estate, Needmas Estate, Ponzi Estate again, Needmas Estate, Needmas Estate again. Man, listen, they just take all the land. See, then you have Ponzi State again, Ponzi Estate lose a lot of land, you know. Douglas and College, Challengers Village lose some too, you know, Lindsay? Challengers Village twice, one, two. Khan Phipps, Pompey, Sagili's estate, you know, Sagili's lost some too. Man, yeah. And St. Anne's and the Point, Harris's estate, St. Thomas in Mid Middle, Middle Island. Oh my goodness. Some belonging challenges. Oh Lord, there's so much of you to call out. Hear, hear. Those of you who are listening down in Sandy Point, listen here good. You all know some of the Canefield name. Sagili's garden. So give this copper hole, bell field, big field, farms copper hole, pasture flat on Lord, Lord Delaney, so give this man a war, small Nancy coffin, big Nancy coffin. <laughs> I mean, you, you have to laugh at you, but seriously, this is so give it all the way down here to Pumps water jib and um, pumps water. Then you have them farms now. Blyton, house table, sick house, garden wall, negro house, upper well, bird side, spring gut, spring gut number two, Dubin, Janita Bottom, West Fall House, Kit. This is what that means with farms, you know. Let's go down here, buddy. Books, Manawa, Bird's Garden. Box number one, box number two and three, garden field, long bottom, round hole, birds cut a hole, dog hole. <laughs> I mean, this is box. Then you come down now to Godwin. Oh my goodness, Godwin. Little Negro house, Samas, little watch. Big watch jib, big watch, Manawa jib, Manawa, Commodore, plum tree, basin field. If you live in Godwin, you know them name, you know, you used to work on the estate, you know that. Little water stone. Uh, listen, these... Come down to Lambert, Side Hill, Grape Tree, Kana, Royal Cane, Lang, Upper Lang Run, Lower Lang Run, Can, Canis Pasture, Little Man of War. Come down to Books again. See them there, Books. Oh Lord, all is done in Books and Wingfield. Uh, Count Williams, number two, Short Run, East Penny, West Penny, Lang Run. You come down to Estridge. You have Robin Johnson, Upper Walk, Lower Walk, Julius Bell, Cabbage Tree, Masses. Or Mrs. Mohagany, Cherry Tree, Low Swan. You come down, let me pass this, you come down to Mansion, Guinea Grass, Still House Robin. Let me come down to Mansion again. West Commodore, Penfield, Bennett, Pasture 7, Upper Garden. Where can I find any number you don't make in care of? Let me come down here, buddy. Molyneux, Little Negro House, <sighs> Christ Church, Low Church, Stony Ground, Millses. Over pasture, old Negro house, Mills pasture, come down in Phillips' Spooners, West Blue Beard, East Blue Beard, Sugar Works, come down to Law Borrier, Borrier Gatefield, Borrier Sick House, Borrier Such. Listen, Lodge, Wellfield, Foreman, Well Bottom, Lodge Sick House, come down to me now, Upper Borrier, Upper Borrier, let me go down to KR, I can't find anything in KR, oh, Hermitage, Bottom Manawa, Coast, Hermitage Wild Mills, Big Slab, Little Slab. Round Hill, Big Manawa, Little Manawa, Breaking Fig Tree, Chicken and Church, 
shop, maka and Brighton, bottom long run, middle long run. One load of land. One load of land. These fellas take up hmm, and put, oh, you know, just get your house which you leave him, a free house paid for by Dr. Simmons. Take it and just take all that land, all them cane feet, there's a load of them, you know. I must, I must get the number for you. 2,424 acres worth of land. Hmm? And put it over there in some in a, in, a, in, a, in a vehicle to be sold to get rid of the debt where he filled up in the country and come telling you about debt reduced to 69 percent under my administration debt reduced is a sleight of hand is a sleight of hand the debt deal you paying for the debt with your house are you done pay for that's what it is so that's no that is no 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 Nothing to, 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 to claim any fame for that the debt was reduced to 69% by taking it and putting it over there to sell out for somebody else. Poof away your land. And he had, he had the heart to use the word poof, you know. When he was saying it, he said, land gone. Poof. He had the heart to say it. Madam Deputy Speaker, shouldn't be talking about land. How can we have any confidence? I don't understand how the Labour Party has any confidence in this leader. Confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. It ain't miss us, you know. Go read Proverbs 25 and verse 19. Confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint have confidence they have so much confidence that they put him back as the leader and not even one person come to hear him make a presentation he rebutted to the budget you know and i ain't seen nobody here even listening to the leader of the opposition don't understand that confidence i was not going to respond to um my good member from number one I tell you why I was not going to do it, member number number one. I was not going to respond to you because, you know, I know in time you will get your presentation to be more cogent. So I give you time to get it cogent. But, you know, you said something, like, when I made a decision early, but then afterwards you said something which I think may have um, caused someone who knew better to say something to me, and so I will share it with you. I'll share it with you. It says, look, you talked about, let me see what it is you actually talked about. You actually spoke something about social services and social, social services and gender affairs. You were a bit critical of them. Person said here, and I can tell you what they said. I just heard it mentioned about the concern about, about, by, about the board. It is a labor administration which enacted in 2013 the legislation, the Child Justice Act and the Children Care and Adoption Act that have triggered the concerns raised by all constituents, our consultants. There are still problems with the legislation which your ministry is now fighting, which I'm now fighting with. I've been fighting it for the last few months to remedy. The administration rushed to open new horizons. No effort was made to enact statutory rules and orders to give it legality. See, that happened before team unity. The person go on to say, your ministry with the assistance of the same board spent several months, and it's true, I've met with them several times, working on the SIRNO, as well as an operational manual, which are now in the legal department. It is the same board which fashioned regulations which have been adopted for implementation throughout the OECS. This board did all the work, which is now adopted by the OECS. The same board which established the Child Care Committee, a requirement of the Act, which administration passed in 2013, but took no action up to some five years after. It is your ministry of the same boat is now tasked with establishing an adoption committee, a requirement for the child here. Listen, what the person is saying, look, don't be critical of what's happening up at social services. You did it the way you did it, at least maybe not you personally, but your, 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 your government. They did a lot of things which were not done properly, and we have the task to now correct them. And we're doing so. We have gone so far and we've done some regulations which are so good that the entire OECS region has adopted what we did in St. Kitts. So the person is saying, 
take him out off of them. That's what they say. Because they're working and doing it good. That's the only comment I make. I'll leave the rest for the time when you become more cogent with your presentation. You know, I really want you to, to be more, with some more oomph, you know? I'll leave it for that time. So yes, Madam Deputy Speaker. Now, at one point, I would not, I would not have wanted to mention my, my senator, but yeah, but a senator, the opposition mentioned Madam Deputy Speaker. Every time she comes, she wants to take a little dig at me. It is so obvious. She can't even hide it. It's so obvious. She was here one time. She started to talk about election next year because somebody in here is sick. They got these rumors on the road that I got stage four cancer. They got a rumor running through the whole world about me having stage four cancer. So they expect election next year. And she made it dig here when she was here one time. I leave it. I let it pass. But she come in the budget now. Agriculture dead under the previous minister. Agriculture dead. Should I let that pass, Madam Deputy Speaker? If you give me another, I will tell you. <laughs> Madam Deputy Speaker, under my watch, hmm? there have been so many successful people in this agriculture. For example, I know one, a big-shouldered one, who pushes a barrow in, in part of the countryside, who has a pig farm, and the pig farm does very well. And the pig farm helps to pay university fees. And the pig farm owner does take me, Madam Speaker, take me to the beach to enjoy myself. Should I say more? Let me leave it. Let me leave it, Madam Deputy Speaker. Let me leave it. Because I don't trouble, I am one of the nicest guys in here, you know. But when you touch, trouble me, I know how to respond. I could respond, but I'll leave it. Madam Deputy Speaker, I don't want to run out of time. Let me see how far I'm Oh, good time. Yes. Madam Deputy Speaker, I want to turn, if you will. Now I have spoken about some of the things raised by the opposition, and there were more, but I can't spend the entire presentation talking about what they raised. I just wanted to raise those points that those are things they should, they must not come here and try to rewrite history. History is a history, is a history. You can't rewrite the history by just coming here and talking. It. I can respond to that historical, you know, anything they say which is not uh, comporting with the past history. I respond to it. But I have some ministries, Madam Deputy Speaker. Human settlements, of course. Universal health insurance, of course. Social security. Social services, gender, fair, solid waste. NHC, all of those are under my ministry. And so I must, Madam Deputy Speaker, speak to some of those ministries, those departments, the work they do, the hard work that they put in to benefit the people of St. Kitts and Nevis. And so, Madam Deputy Speaker, I want to turn, first of all, to the broad head of human settlement and to point out that in 2016, a survey was done in St. Kitts and Nevis. And this is what was found out from that survey, which makes the ministry, my ministry in our human settlement, having to take a focus on it. We are committed to eradicating the troubling truth that there are persons today in the Federation living in substandard conditions, where their households have no water and sanitary facilities. As a nation that has graduated at, by every international evaluation method, we must eradicate this outrageous reality by ensuring that every home has running water, coupled with the adequate hygienic facilities. It is one of our challenges we have, Madam Deputy Speaker. When in 1980, the, the PAM NRP administration took office, sugar was key. 
So the, the land is being used for sugar. People, your family, if you, if you know, take a look at St. Kitts. Everybody used to live at the God sides. Near to the God sides. You couldn't live on nice, plush, plush land. Check it out. Most of St. Kitts before was on the God side. That is where you were able to get your house. And so, on that God side, near to the God side, some houses, and even in Bastille, if I walk you to Bastille, Madam Deputy Speaker, you would be ashamed to know just how Bastille looked. I know this is going all around the world, saying it, but it's true. Bastille got some places in Bastille. All right, let me don't talk. Let me, let me just read it. In St. Kitts, there were 211 households with pit latrine. 468 persons live in those households. 71 households with pit latrines own the home. 128 house, households with pit latrines have no electricity. Sorry, they have electricity. 111 households with pit latrines have running water. 61 households with pit latrines do not have electricity, no running water. In St. Kitts, there are 294 households with no toilet facilities. Hear you know what I tell you? 194 households had no toilet facility. In them, 353 people live. 54 households were without toilet facilities. 89 households without toilet facilities have electricity. 61 households without toilet facilities have running water. 94 households do not have electricity now running water. You believe we should let that continue, Madam Deputy Speaker? Not in a nation where we are graduated by every international test that has been done. We have to do something about that. That's what my ministry is going to focus on in 2021 and going forward. Because here it is. It may not please you when I say this, but I can say. In Christchurch, 10 people have pitch latrine. In St. Anne's, 40 people got pitch latrine. In Christchurch, 15 people got a toilet. In St. Anne's, 16 people got a toilet. In St. George's East, I can bust in there, 38 people, pit latrines, 27 people, no latrine, no toilet. In St. George's West, 21 people, pit latrine, 21 people, no toilet. In St. John's, Lord Timothy, I'm sorry for you. 38 people, pit latrine, 35 people, no toilet. In St. Mary's, that's all by me. <laughs> 19 people, pit latrine, 21 people, no toilet. In St. Paul's, 12 people, pit latrine. 22 people, no toilet. St. Peter, 14 people, pit latrine. 17 people, no toilet. St. Thomas, 9 people, pit latrine. 20 people, no toilet. Trinity, this is number you, right? Trinity, and the other one, the number you. Two people, pit latrine. Nobody who didn't have no toilet. So listen. The total persons affected by this scourge, I will call it a scourge, 211 people in this sentence here, by 2016, had pit latrine, and 194 people, no toilet. Can that remain that way? That's what my ministry is going to focus on in this 2021. Now, I know some of you feel a little depressed because I'm talking like this, you know, but it is what it is. And we have to do something about it. If I don't talk about it, nobody can try to do nothing about it. Because maybe if I don't talk about it, when I look in front of it, nobody bothers me because nobody knows about it. So I have to talk about it. And we have to address it. That's the bottom line. We have to address it. We are going to address it. In the Ministry of Human Settlement, of course, we're going to do a lot of work with private sector as well. We engage private sector to join with the public sector in partnership to do, well, I should back up and say, I talk about what we're going to do with the pit latrine and so on. I have at least nearly a million dollars in the budget to deal with that in 2021. And in 2022, we'll just add more in the budget again until we get it eradicated. But we are joining with the private, uh, private sector to do more in terms of housing. We want to 
apart from the focus which we have had on low-income, low-cost housing, we're going to do what we can to make sure we get the middle-income housing sector accelerated. And when we, you know, for me, dealing with the local, the, the, the low-income housing to NHC was always exhilarating to me. Talking about the bigger, better, it was always exhilarating. But I'm going to use this term to make sure that we accelerate a bit more. We're going to accelerate in the area of middle to upper income. Not ending anything to do with low income, but just making sure that there are those professionals. I want to see all of those people go back from the universities, just married perhaps, to income, to family income, nine, ten, eight, nine, ten thousand dollars a month into your own middle income home with your transportation to take you across the country while you're still able to pay your, 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 your mortgage, your student loan. That's what we want to see. You must not be there struggling because you can't fit into a low income home because you're not low income. And if you can't fit into the other people who build in the, rich, in the rich places. So we have to satisfy you as well. And that's what we're going to work on come this, this next year. As a matter of fact, Madam Deputy Speaker, I am currently in discussions with an entity to get involved in heavy production of homes here in St. Kitts. I'm also in discussion with another local investor who I would want to encourage and who has agreed basically to look at two or three projects right here in St. Kitts. One of them in my hometown, one of them in um, Lindsay's area, and one of them in Sandy Point. And others, because we want to satisfy the needs of those persons whom I just mentioned to do with housing. We're going to target, target those middle income professionals, but we're not going to lose sight of, we're not going to lose sight of what we're doing with our low income homes. Let me, Madam Deputy Speaker, point out that in the last five years, one of the focuses of this ministry was on those low income, low cost housing for those who are at the low end. And we have had so many applications for people who, are, who do not fall in that category that what we have ended up doing is basically asking them to go to the bank tomorrow and then we will see how we can facilitate them with building. Because they did not fall in that category. Remember, you know, Madam Deputy Speaker, that when we embarked on what we call the Unity Housing Program, one of the things we did, we reduced the interest rate at a scale from 2%, as low as 2%, to a maximum of 5%. So based on the level of income, there were persons who were getting a 2% mortgage. Nowhere else in the world, I, I don't know if anybody could point one, that you can hear 2% mortgage. That's what we have at NHC. And the funny thing is, they were getting that on a super in, improved home. Remember, you know, the previous administration never used to paint the homes. They never used to put in any cupboards, no tiles. They build the thing and give you. So when you move in, you have to try to knock up some things in there. When we build you a home today, you walk into your home and it's fit for purpose. The bedrooms became bigger, now two beds could hold in there. The bathroom became bigger, you could do a little exercise in there as well. The roof became hard, we moved from shingles to galvaloo. And some of them are concrete roof as well. Then of course you have a nice veranda outside well, with a, with a railing and everything, you can sit down behind it. You, know, you can't fall off the landing so easy now. That's the kind of improvement that we did. And, Madam Deputy Speaker, if you see the kitchen cupboards there, it's like when you walk into Hilton. True. Some of these local guys who could make cupboards, they're good. We underrate them, they're good. 
Those guys out there making covers for the houses, some of find them, they are very, very good. We call them, we own too much, man. But they're good. I'm telling you, I don't want to get a couple from overseas again, you know. I want them built by the local people. I ain't going to ask for them to go buy anymore. Ask for them to go against you, neither UTDC. But I want the local people build it. I like how the local people build it. They're good. Believe me, they are very good. But during that period, Madam Deputy Speaker, we succeeded in focusing on that five year period, focus on 512 homes. Listen, independence habitat, they were completed in 2015 to 2016. 92 of them. 92. Under the Unity Housing Pro Solutions, we tell you you have built 300, we did 334. 334. Then we had some bank funded houses, 86 of them. We worked at NHC to bring about what I will describe as a housing revolution. One that saw bigger, better, and I like to describe them, Madam Deputy Speaker, as houses and homes fit for kings and queens. When you move into your home, you move in your furniture, and you live. Will some of them have problems? Any house you build will have a little problem. But I want to say to persons, you have three months, and if necessary, I'll extend it to six months. To find any error, anything wrong that needs to be fixed. But I find people coming to NAC all the 10 years after want NAC to fix something that they don't build since 10 years ago. That can't, that's not supposed to happen. The house is yours. I don't have a problem getting anything remedied in six months. Three months, six months. But to come 10 years after to tell me your tires kicking up. Who tell you age of your water on your tires? Or who tell you leave, something happened, make the tires coming up after 10 years. It is your responsibility, it is your home. Take care of your home. And you know, Madam Deputy Speaker, I should not move on from housing without saying what a challenge we're having. It's a huge challenge. Though we built your homes, carried it to eight, from 756 square feet to 862 square feet, Though we moved the shingle off the roof and gave you a woman concrete. Though we put our proper metal banisters on the, and handrails on the, on the veranda. Though we improved the cabinetry inside so it looked first class. Though we changed some of the shutters from Miami shutters. Now we walk up to the front, you got glass windows. It never used to be. Now we've done all that. Some persons are still not paying good. And it had nothing to do with COVID. Some persons are delinquent and it has nothing to do with COVID. Listen here. Folks, if you're out there and you're having a problem paying for anything, including your home, the best thing to do is to walk into the institution and chat with the people there and get something sorted out. There's always a remedy. Find a way to deal with it. The worst thing you could do is to miss a payment. Because when you miss, you've got to pay interest on. So you pay more money for the property that you have if you miss a payment because when you miss, you're paying additional interest. So whereas you were target, you probably had to pay 100,000 for your house, you end up paying 112 because you miss payments and you're paying late. It's the worst thing you can do. It is much better for you to go into the institution, sit down and talk, and do some work so that you are current. We said, Julie, know something if you want to save money. You are hurting only you when you pay late. You're not hurting the institution, you know. You're not hurting NHC or the bank or what it is. You're hurting yourselves when you pay late. And if the bank tells you pay 500 a month, pay six. Because if you pay six, you were targeted to pay 100,000. When you pay six, you end up paying 95,000 or 80,000. Because you pay more, the interest gets less. Simple. 
Now, some people feel they need to pay 500, they not pay 500 because they can't afford it. You can't afford it, you end up paying more. You are enslaving yourselves. So I'm appealing to you, those of you who have been, especially for NHC, please, go in and sit with the management team, have a chat with them, tell them what's going on in there, so let them do something. You know, some of us live in a house, right? When we got the house, our child was 10. Seven years later, the child is 17. Eight years later, the child is 18. The child starts to work. And we ain't make no change. But the child working and the child could contribute, isn't it? Is he house too? And an extra hundred dollars saved you money. But the child come big. And the child has drink more beer out on the road and I'll drink up everything and nothing going into which party sleeping every night. You can change that. Every person has a responsibility to make sure that when they only pay, don't let nobody get your name apart. Take your name out of people's mouth. Pay once you can. Or go to the institution and get some adjustment done. Madam Deputy Speaker, I want now to turn to, well, I should actually, before I go, indicate to you that. Where we are at NHC at the moment, when I got the ministry in 2015, it was never audited. Remember, this institution is from 1996. There was an attempt to audit somewhere around 2000. Did not complete because of a number of concerns in the management letter. But never revisited. I imagine that what happened is that my friend Dr. Harris was no longer Minister of Housing and it became carried by, by, by my opponent who I defeated, who probably never paid no attention to them, see they have a CG driver, and then afterwards to ask him, and you know, they were not interested in that, but I'm interested in that. So what we have done, I have got my accounts people, to, new people who I got in, to bring the accounts up to date from all the way back down in the early 2000, all the way up to 2019, and it's now being audited, properly audited, so that I could bring it and table it here sometime this term. That is where, NHC must be audited and it must hit the table of the parliament as soon as possible. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'll say no more on housing except to say 2021 through 2025, or whenever uh, the, the, the Prime Minister decides to call the election. Huh? <laughs> well, we will be. We will continue on our thrust for providing homes for those who cannot move the bank. You see what kind of language I'm using? You go bank and you ain't qualify. How you gonna get a house? And you got three and four in your family. Hmm? That's where we're coming at NHC. And then of course, those who are above that threshold, we're now working on that, as I mentioned earlier. Now I need to speak, Madam Deputy Speaker, about, you see I did talk about delinquency at, at housing and it, I, I, rather than going to all of, all of it, it's a, it's, a, it's a sad state to look at it, to tell you the truth, but let me leave that. Let me leave that. <laughs> Madam Deputy Speaker. You heard me calling the names of the field and the Zambi Point. We used to live out it. So West, Westmoreland and, and all the, them kind of names here? You used to go to Kale Vega, Kale Vega? Oh, yeah, it's in Lindsay. Oh, oh, oh. So you're not, so, okay. <laughs> and you know, so get this, okay. Madam Deputy Speaker, one of the focuses for 2021 through 2025 is, of course, universal health insurance. It is something which we began to work on in the previous five years. What we did was we put together a committee, a commission, headed by Azilla Clark. We invited the University of the West Indies Health Economics Unit to partner with us. 
They were on the ground for 12 months. And they did uh, their work and produced what they call a blueprint for the implementation of universal health insurance. We then engage Mono Chappelle, the actuaries. Um, one of the leaders in that firm is Derek Osborne, who is well known to us as the person who does work for social security, in fact, most of the security sy uh, systems in the region. So they did the costing of that project. The project is of significant cost. But the benefits, I believe, will be better for all of us um, who will stop looking at the cost. So, I want to point out to you why it is important to have universal health. Here's a letter written on the 14th of December, 2020. I must say I did invite him to tell me, the person, what work he has been doing to help persons in need. And this is what he wrote. Most recently, I should tell you, it is, it is Mickey Weintraub. He has a, a, a foundation called Mickey's Hope. He said, most recently I, need to, I needed to raise and did raise $345,806. This is one man who raised the kind of money for overseas medical treatment for individuals unable to afford their treatment. Two of the individuals are not expected to survive more than a few weeks to two months absent of surgeries. Two others were cancer patients. Current survival rate statistics for one of these cancer patients was 18% with radiation treatment, but 92 to 95% with early radiation treatment. The other had cancer of the right testicle. In the recent past, I also needed to raise another $186,693, six cancer patients with four of them being breast cancer, one stomach cancer, and one cervical cancer. This chap has been single-handedly using his, connection, his connections worldwide to raise money to for people in St. Kitts and the Nevis who find themselves in the unfortunate position of not being able to pay for the treatment, whether here or abroad. He tells me, for example, you need $99,900 for an individual in need of tricuspid valve replacement. You hear me talk about pulmonary artery and superior vena cava this morning, right? <laughs> the tricuspid valve is one of the two main valves on the right side of your heart. And that is what needs to be replaced. It's a, it is a top priority for me, he says. And at the moment, having been informed that this individual did die absent surgery, then he says he has to wave another $89,900 for someone with aneurysm. Again, you know what that is, some enlargement, bulging, if you will, of some of the, some, some people have aneurysms in the heart, some have of the head, because, you know, there's this bulging which takes place, and then, it, of course, it could rupture resulting in death. 36,000 for a patient with cancer, RMS. 32,000 for individual in need of surgery for total reconstruction of the anus. 72,900 for an individual in need of a kidney transplant. 82,000 for an individual in need of surgery to restore his hearing. 92,000 for, not, sorry, 90,000 uh, for medical bills incurring, sorry, incurred in the treatment of leukemia. And he goes on and on and on. And I mention this to tell you that there comes a time, if not in your own life, in some life, in, the, in, in some of your family's life, where they are faced with bills to pay for health-related health, health uh, uh, incidences, and nothing could be worse painful for you who are not sick, to be depressed by the fact that your family member is not in a position to access the services that they need. So not only sickness for them becomes sickness for you. And that is why 
I believe that we should embrace the concept of universal health. So let me tell you, don't think that I'm talking about universal health for free. I know everybody will want everything free. You all put on your pads because I believe people should pay. The concept of pooling all of the resources of a greater number, the large number of persons, will make it easy for everybody to get care. The law of large numbers will ensure that there's equality, both in benefits as well as in, in any um, payment. Don't be surprised and pad up if you have to pay 5% of your income. So what? When you call, have somebody who wants to, when you find somebody in your family who needs $89,000 for an aneurysm, you have it? Or you feel good when you know universal health can pay for it? Think about it. When your mother tells you she went to the doctor and they diagnosed she got breast cancer, and what she has to raise is $90,000 and you ain't have it. It could rip the heart out of you. That is why you need universal health insurance. At least you know, even if she does die, the opportunity was provided to her to be able to do something about it. And let's face it, I talk about your mother, it could be you. Can your mother alone forget sick, you know, you too. So, we are working on universal health. So this coming year, while it is true that we've had COVID and all of our revenues are in shatters, and it may slow down the process of implementation, we are not going to lose sight of implementing universal health as we go to 2021. You'll hear more about it. We are at the point, however, where we have to look at the legislative framework for the implementation of universal health. Why? After all, if it's going to be salary reduction, we have to have something on which to stand to be talking about salaries and we are paying for. Dealing with it, we can't just pull it out of the air. It has to be properly legislated. So we're going to be looking at the legislative framework in short order. We're going to be looking at the time of commencement, whether it is this 2021 or 2022. We're going to be looking at the commencement and how to raise the money to pay for it. Not losing sight of the fact that you need to know what benefits are going to be provided. What all I'm going to be paid for. That has to be done. What I'm talking about, we have to make sure that it's sustainable. And so in 2021, we're going to cover all that ground and be ready for when the cabinet and the country says, go, then we will go. Universal health, ladies and gentlemen, I consider it to be one of the significant decisions any government can make. And we've made some important decisions in this country, you know. We made some important decisions. I remember the land acquisition, which I spoke about from Robert, when Robert, Robert Bradshaw's time. There were many persons who were against it, you know. But it turned out that that land acquisition, which was paid for $22 million, they don't make $22 million more than 15 times. Major decision. But it was made. I remember Social Security, when Social Security was being formed. You know how many people were against it? Well, put your hand in my money. Nobody wants them. Even though people out there ain't paying the social security. Fixed, yeah. huh? And some of them let's be carrying the thousand dollars in them and they ain't paying. Yeah. I'm saying those are major decisions, landmark decisions. People over 65 today getting the only income because of that. Important decisions. But it was not popular when it was being done. There was an important decision. Abolition of personal income tax. Hmm? You know, even though people st 
still say you are. But what it did, it drove so much money in the pockets of people that there was this the propensity to consume trigger. People were having hundred dollars for the first time and people began to spend. Eventually, government got more money than they will ever get from personal income tax. Listen, there was a time, you know. If you, I must look for the legislation. When you reach $2,000 threshold, 55% tax was for the government. So can you imagine when you make $2,000, $1,100 is the government own? That's how it was, you know. That was what the tax thing was. 55% was the top tax on personal income. Which means if you're a guy working for two thousand dollars, eleven hundred dollars is the government owed. So those are your minimum wage, all about or the about. Eleven hundred dollars would have been the government own. That was put, that was taken away with the abolition of personal income tax. Yes, you might say that there were other things that came in, but that left eleven hundred dollars in your pocket if you were earning two thousand dollars a month. Landmark decisions. Citizenship by investment. Can you imagine Sankis was the first place to come up with this thing about citizenship by investment in 1984? In 1984, Sankis and Nevis were the first to come up with this thing about citizenship by investment. Huh? First in the world. Today, everybody around the world rushing to do what Sankis did. And even though they're being fought now by, fought now by, by some other, all kinds of institutions, we were the and we have benefited from it big time. You remember that time there was something called SIDF had in over a billion dollars? Private foundation. It was supposed to be a government foundation to make it private. One billion dollars in there. I came here, yes. I came here and asked, asked and, and what was the answer at the time? Let me see if I remember that. Yes, I'm Minister of Finance. Can you tell me about the family, the, the, the this idea of um, the ownership and, and how much money answer. What are you asking me? What are you asking me? You have to go look for the information for yourself. It's a private foundation. Ask the foundation. Ask the foundation. foundation. Government money, you know? And that was the answer when I asked the question in here. Here, not about. Yeah, but listen, you all don't know we've gone through this parliament here, you know? That's why sometimes when I hear people say they're going back to the one, I just wonder where they're going. Yes. I mean, I mean, you know, <laughs> Southeast Peninsula World. You know how much criticism the, the government get? Road to nowhere. I never hear more. And now it is the road to everywhere. <laughs> I mean, that's what we have. Major decisions. Major decisions that have improved the quality of life of the people of St. Kitts and Nevis. Reach, reaping great benefits for our people. Port Zante. Woo, the world. Water, wash it with. <laughs> Port Zante. Can you imagine that? Those of you who don't know before Port Zante, you think of Saint Kitts without Port Zante. But they wanted water to wash it away. Major decisions affecting the quality of our lives. We have made major decisions in the past, even independence. It was coming, yes, but even that. Detractors here and there. But we have made major decisions in the past. We have been a sort of pioneering country. And we must continue to pioneer. And while universal health may not necessarily be pioneering because others have done it, let us take responsibility for ensuring that those who are less fortunate than us, whenever they get sick, they know how they're going to get their medical bills or the services. Even if not, they will pay get the services that they need. That's what they need. And so, universal health is coming. And if you're Derek Fates, I know you're listening. He's a man who always tries to encourage me to keep on going with universal health, so I can say that. Then, of course, we have Social Security. I have already interjected matters about Social Security. Madam Deputy Speaker, 
and I think I spoke already to how Social Security was treated by the previous administration. So I quickly want to look at, because this is at one point, you know, Madam Deputy Speaker, the eighth actual report had that the funds would be uh, exhausted in 2052. The valuations say 2041, 2036 to 2041, sooner rather than later. As Minister of Social Security, I have the, the, the task now to make sure that the direction changes, that we go back towards the 2052 and beyond, so that a lot of the investments, these frivolous investments, wicked investments, um, um, Beacon Heights and so where money just tossed away, we have to do something about that. Because that was the way of the past, we now have to look to the future. Of course, we are going to improve our compliance and collections and contributions because millions out there on the road. Millions out there we have to collect what we have on the road. We are going to leverage our, in, our technology to improve the service delivery at Social Security. Of course, we're going to look at the parametric reforms of, social, of the social security system. And in that regard, I can tell you that discussions, as recommended by the actual going on, talking about increasing pensionable age from 62 to 65, talking about adjustments of the minimum pension, I think something was done in that regard already, from 3,900 to a little higher, changing the age pension to retirement pension, where pension is only paid once employment cease, contribution rate to be increased, the suggestion of 13%, qualifying conditions for age pension moved from 150 to 300, increasing number of years over which insurable wages average can be calculated to calculate pension, in other words, not in the last 15 years, increase the current taxable ceiling from 6,500 to maybe 8,500 or 10,000, at the moment it's only those who are up to 6,000 pay. So that people, I mean, over years people's salary have, have gone up, so therefore we can look at raising the ceiling. And there's a whole set of things recommended by the actuary for us to consider in 2021. Um, Social Security will, will work on these in conjunction with universal health so that we do not burden, overburden the, the, the taxpayer with our deductions. So we look forward to moving along with Social Security in 2021. One of the major things we have to do is in heights. I'll tell you more about that in the future. So, I want Mr. Speaker to turn to solid waste. And, Madam, sorry, Madam Deputy Speaker, <laughs> I want to turn to solid waste. Good time. Madam Deputy Speaker, I want to tell you that when the leader of the opposition made his presentation, he had nobody in the, in, in, the, in the gallery. I did not invite them, they came on their own. I applaud them for that. These are people who work hard, cleaning our, I mean, making sure that our surroundings are safe and clean. You don't understand. A lot of people don't understand the humongous task that they take on every day. So I want to thank them for, for coming to be here. I want to thank them for being here. Thank them for the hard work that they do. A lot of what's happening at Solid Waste, Madam Deputy Speaker, is driven by a five-point plan which was instituted a couple of years ago. The five-point plan spoke to a national cleanup, embarked on a national cleanup campaign. The first time we did it, cost over $200,000. Hmm? $200,000. Every community was able to get bins. These folks are working overtime and they're collecting overtime. Well, I don't know. They were working overtime, weekends and, and so on in helping to, to, to move all the garbage. You know what we're trying to do, Madam Deputy Speaker? People have a way. Minister of Environment, I can say it? Of course. For me, but you nasty. <laughs> I didn't say it, I didn't say it. Okay, well, I wouldn't say it then. <laughs> 
People have a way by them, Deputy Speaker. They just throw down things. Oh, yes. Push it in the bush. That is drinking out our bottle, drop it on the street. Some of them walking with their little children, the children open the box, child on the box, they wouldn't even say, no, 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 darling, take it up. And it seems like nothing, but it adds up. Yes, a lot of people doing it is plenty, plenty garbage. End up in the drain, down underneath the thing, you can't get it out. Some go down in the sea, mm -hmm. stifling, you know, choking out the corals and so. And I'm happy to speak, we got to stop it. Some people in St. Kitts and Nevis, you got to stop it. And it is a member for number eight, your time is expired. Madam Deputy Speaker, I appreciate if you, with your permission, I ask my colleagues for another half an hour. I would like to ask another hour. The question, ask another half an hour. the question is, should the honorable member for number eight receive 30 minutes? Those in favor? Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Thank you, my colleagues, for the extra half an hour. Now I have to speed up. Madam Deputy Speaker, I was talking about these, the littering. The littering has become as if it's just a pastime. I mean, it's unfortunate, really. I remember going down the street there one day. I mean, I saw the bottles on the, I think it's not Panwood, the one going down to the bay. Forget the name, but adjoin the Panwood. Sandown Road. Bottles. Could fill two trucks. And I thought, wow, they were just choking out the drain. So water wouldn't go through. It's amazing. Folks, if you're listening to me, I am one person you should listen to. I heard, I know you heard the Minister of Environment the other day, but I agree with him. Yes. Stop shutting all your bottles, sir, man. It ain't right. No. There are containers around, put them in the containers. You are, listen, here's the danger. You all are, let me see. Let me see if I could help you to understand the danger. You're trying to something on the street. It can collect water. Water breeds mosquitoes. Mosquitoes carry disease. Dengue. Dengue. Chicken gun there. Zika. What else? What the other one is? All those are things that can be spread. They are called vector borne diseases. You are contributing to. Spreading illness across the country. Prospect of spreading illness across the country. Stop it. Stop it, yes. We have containers around the street. We have got, just as part of our plan, stop littering. Yes. I am asking those who need litter one, summon them. Don't afraid to summon them. No, when you summon one or two, you can stop. You are here? Someone's one out to a U.S. can stop. Yes, sir. We have to stop it. It's part of the five-point plan, cleaning up. We removed all of those old fridge, old stove, <laughs> kind of garbage out there, just, just next to your home, and carry them to the landfill. And then, of course, we introduce a new connection model so that we would miss no place. Everywhere was getting service once. As a matter of fact, we even went to treating places twice a week. Say it again. Yes, it's bad all over, man. A new collection model. Each zone, the days were increased from a sporadic delivery of service to twice weekly. Three new 20 yards compactor trucks were purchased by, in its, by solid waste. Three new trucks to help to facilitate the collection of, um, of waste. We put our money where our mouth is. These guys go on the radio, you hear them talking and promoting and telling you about the removal of garbage, discussing with you, and I want us to give them the support that we can because they're supporting us. Then they moved along. And we introduce some smart bins. If you ain't got none, don't say nothing. We introduce smart bins because we wanted to. 12,000 bins we gave out, you know. 12,000 bins were distributed across the country so that we could determine right at the door quantities and the level of garbage that we collect. Because we want to know the numbers, because the num data drives decisions. 
And the data we collect will help us to drive any decision that we're going to make in the future. Because, you know, we're talking about things like waste to energy. That's, that's our, our future moves. Turning some of that waste to energy. And we have been discussing with the people who have been doing this for years. Advanced discussions on the way. Of course, the technology includes gasification. Um, it is capable of resolving urgent issues of pollution, causing, and ca causing um, or I should say, preventing the landfill expansion. One of the, hope, one of the hopes is that once we get to the point of waste to energy, it would reduce the importance of adding additional cells, very costly additional cells, so that um, if we could avoid having to build more cells for thousands, sorry, millions of dollars, then of course waste to energy will be a benefit, not only for reducing the cost of energy, helping to reduce the cost of energy, but also for preventing us from having to do additional expensive cells. If after all we don't do that, we're well, we going to find a place to put garbage. We can't really have to find another garbage site, isn't it? We're hoping that we don't have to do that. Then, of course, we started a... Uh, sorry, we, we were looking at the National Recycling Program. This proposes an integrated approach to waste minimization should be built through the built-in of three hours reduce, reuse, recycle in our overall effort to wa uh, at waste separation at its source as we work towards becoming zero, a zero-waste nation. I should add, as part of this overall cleaning up, we engage with, what resources is again? The name escapes me now. What they've been doing is bailing out our hard metal, our metal. All cars, all fridge, anything metal have been bailed out by these, um, the team which now is engaged at solid waste. I am trying to find a name here, in Enclave I think it is, Enclave Resources? Yes, enclave. enclave Resources. So far, Madam Deputy Speaker, they have moved out, they have bailed out of the country over one million pounds of metal. That's a load of metals out there in the grass and all over the place. You know? 10 million pounds, sorry. I'm calling the figure wrong, Madam Deputy Speaker. 10 million pounds of metal. Old car, old fridge, whatever you... They have bailed that out of the country. It might return in some other new vehicle you're driving, but for the time being, it's bailed out of the country. So that the solid waste is engaged in a lot of work helping to keep our environment, our environments really clean. And they need your support. I go back to the point. Tossing down even a small piece of paper where it's not supposed to be tossed is wrong. Never mind tossing down things like bottles and these box drinks and all of those things. Because they are a source of life, if you will for mosquitoes and other things, rodents, all kinds of things that can spread disease. Zika came, it disappeared, you know it gone. Chikungunya came, it disappeared, you know it gone. Since none of us know it gone, let's try and do things to make sure that it don't come back. Because you don't know. And carrying on those habits could easily feed into into um, helping to promote uh, the propagation of those diseases through our rodents. Madam Deputy Speaker, our overall aim at Solid Waste Management Corporation is to satisfy, apart from satisfy what is good, doing good, apart from all of that, we are feeding into all of those sustainable development goals that the whole world has been talking about you know, there's 17 uh, those goals that have been talked about. We feed into sustainable development goal, goal 11, 7, 14, 13, 15. All of them, some element of what's 
solid waste management is doing helps, to, helps us to achieve those goals as set by the United Nations. So we can't lose sight of that. We have promised, we have pledged to respond in a way so that we could reduce all kinds of emissions, reduce all kinds of having clean water, making sure that we have good health, and we must continue to do our little part in our little home, right near to the bin where you, that's why we gave you a bin, you know. We gave you a bin. We are trying to get you to understand things must go in the bins. You didn't have to pay for it. Maybe we have to get some more. But we, have, we, are, we are trying to educate you. Put the things in the receptacle so that we could transport them properly to the landfill and dispose of them in the most efficient way possible to drive energy as well as to make sure that there is no spreading of disease which is borne by mosquitoes and the like. And so, Madam Deputy Speaker, there's a lot I can probably say about Solid Waste Management Corporation, but I hope that the team who is here uh, do not um, feel upset that I didn't say enough. But as you can see, I'm running down of time and I have to go to Social Services Gender Affairs. And I will turn to Social Services and Gender Affairs. I'll just close off this section by saying, in my capacity as Minister with Responsibility for, Social, for Solid Waste Management Corporation, I'm delighted, Mr. Speaker, to use this occasion once again to thank the management, the staff, the board of directors, all of them for their outstanding commitment to quality service, to the people of St. Kitts and Nevis, and to offer again my commendation to the commendation of the Ministry for the ongoing quest to ensure high levels of efficiency, high standards, and we look forward to them having more and more capable persons in the organization to deliver those services. Let me, therefore, turn to social services, gender affairs. Madam Deputy Speaker, at the Department of Gender Affairs, There was a partnership between the Chamber of Industry and Commerce and the department providing $20,000 worth of food vouchers for clients of gender affairs in both St. Kitts and Nevis. At the same department, UN women donated masks that were distributed to groups who work closely with the department and victims of gender-based violence. The department got involved in a rehabilitation program for females. Those who were inmates had been served by the department. However, because of COVID, there was a slowdown, a bit of an inaction, if you will, an interaction even between the department and those who were inmates. But they have had the opportunity to benefit from improving their skills in things like crochet and hair braiding and sewing and manufacturing of bags so that when they do return to society, if they cannot find a job to work with someone, they can employ themselves. In our society, everybody wants to look for a job, but some people can employ themselves. And so this is to give them the kind of skills so that they can apply it when they're again freed from prison. There was a one-week workshop for teen mothers and at-risk girls. And this, of course, was sponsored by UNICEF. It was a tremendous success despite all of the COVID challenges. The second tranche of funding from UNESCO is expected to support the gender quality the National Gender Quality Action Plan. Madam Deputy Speaker, the department was unable to launch the Boys Mentorship Program uh, this year. Again, challenges with COVID. One of the things that was accomplished in this term was uh, an updating of certain reports, which had been suspended since 2002. 
it would appear as if some of the reports had been overdue. They have now been able to take care of it. In 2021, there will be a focus on pastry making, backyard gardening and sewing. Those will be taught to the same inmates at the prison um, as part of the rehabilitation program. The department will partner also with Crab House so that those prisoners could benefit from the expertise of those at the Crab House. The prospects of training 30 women and girls in leadership and governance and democracy is something we look forward to in 2021. We also look forward to partnering with development agencies to have vulnerable women enrolled in skills training and other skills training programs. Madam Deputy Speaker, under community and social development, 632 males benefited from school uniforms. 604 females benefited from school uniforms. Those persons who had someone who died 17 persons, 17 families benefited from some support for their burial. 17 males actually. And 20 females benefited. So some 37 people, 37 families I will say, benefited from financial support from the social community and social development ministry in dealing with lost family in 2020. Madam Deputy Speaker, food voucher, 66 males, male-headed homes, got vouchers for food, 221 female-headed homes, got vouchers for food. Medical assistance, Madam Deputy Speaker, I should break this down a bit. Uh, there's a Zone 1, East Bastier, Connery and St. Peter's, 12 males, 36 females got IK service, IK support, 52 males, 49 females got cancer treatment support, 2 females were assisted going overseas, 4 males MRI, 3 females MRI, surgery 3 males, 2 females. In Zone 2, Central and West Bastier, 19 males got IK support, 58 females. Cancer, 59 males, 80 females. Overseas, one person, one male and two females were assisted in that, in that zone. MRI, one male, one female were assisted in that zone. And for surgery, three males and four females. Rather than list all of the zones, Madam Deputy Speaker, let me just say, in total, 66 males got support from the ministry dealing with IKEA. 221 females got support. In terms of cancer treatment, 267 males, 320 females. For overseas treatment, 4 males, 5 females. Services from the M of MRI, 8 males, 10 females. Surgery, 16 males, 7 females. We think that in 2021, there will be a heightened focus on the role of seniors under the Seniors Enrichment Program in an effort to ensure that our seniors live a dignified and purposeful life and that we age, or they age, we age, gracefully. There will be a focus on improving the management of the community centers. We're having a challenge with the community centers, of course. As you know, maintenance is a challenge. So we have to put some more focus on that in 2021. It may mean, it may mean that some services at the, social, at the health centers may have to be paid for. It may mean that. You will hear more about that as we go on into 2020. One. Madam Deputy Speaker, under the Counseling Department, 
the, the, the ministry provides important counseling for, when you consider that there are so many battered uh, uh, persons who are in need of counseling, the ministry provides counseling services. And so, in, the, in 2020, there was the creation of two Family Matters Counseling positions. Eight Family Matters Counselors were retained by USAID. Under the funding agreement, salaries were covered by USAID. Also in 2020, they continue to engage vulnerable families in the Family Matters Intervention Program to reduce the level of risks identified to the administration of the youth service, the youth service eligibility tool. The Family Matters Intervention has achieved, has achieved excellent overall results in risk reduction in the families who have been part of the program. There's a 73% average was achieved over a two-year cycle. <clears throat> 2020 cohort of Families for Family Matters had 48 families at start with 35 completing the program and several families, of course, dropped out. However, in the cohort, there was an impressive 90% reduction in overall risk factor identified. And so, in 2020 also, the tracking was implemented for persons seeking psychological support during COVID-19. The counseling department and the JNF Psychological Services collaborated on that issue. The numbers indicate that during the height of the lockdown and immediately after, the department responded to 156 cases for psycho psychological support that were related to COVID. In 2021, the intention is to continue with training, training the professionals, expanding the counseling department to a national counseling center. In that regard, to create a deputy director position for counseling. It's already agreed to. And while, well, I will leave that there. It's already agreed to. Madam Deputy Speaker, on the probation and child protection services, there is in 2020, there was refresher training in the use of the MESAI and SEBRAI assessment tools. I hope I pronounced those properly. There was also the technical working group established to review national diversion programs, rehabilitation and, re and regeneration strategy. So that, um, and one, one case, for example, Madam Deputy Speaker, is that UNICEF provided 30,000 US dollars for the purchase of tablets and other hardware to support case management systems. Uh, also in 2020, there was a distribution of hygiene packages from UNICEF to foster children and teen mothers. Again in 2020, there was a review of the foster care program to review committee implementation by the Probation and Child Welfare Board. And at New Horizon, there was a retrofitting of the classrooms funded by, from the OECS Juvenile Justice Rehabilitation Project. One of the major achievements was 100% pass rate by, student, by residents who attempted CSEC exams. And so um, this ministry wants to record his congratulations to those students who went there for some reason or the other, affecting them, having them uh, in a facility to assist them, and yet they were able to, to be very successful in their CSEC exams. At, at the Habilitation Center, relationships are being forged with new partners to facilitate internships and training for the residents to assist with their reintegration into society. Madam Deputy Speaker, I want to in the next five minutes that I have, indicate that we have been given a mandate by the people to deliver for them. 
we have started and we have demonstrated that we have a safer and stronger nation. I've given you the reasons why we are safer, why we are stronger. I've looked at the myth and the attempts to rewrite history in this parliament and how we looked at how the previous administration dealt with our lands, our patrimony, and how they poofed it away wantonly and I may say even unashamedly. While being critical of persons getting a thousand dollars a month for three months, their period of administration of the Social Security show that they ripped the heart out of Social Security. All of the valves of the heart were ripped apart. We have the task now to restore Social Security to a point where we can say its life has been lengthened for future generations. We have looked, Madam Deputy Speaker, at what happened with La Valley. La Valley, where $85 million was tossed away, ending up in some people's pockets who are enjoying boat rides all over the world today. $85 million that you and I have to pay. And they go on gallivanting with the $85 million. Because there's nothing down at La Valley cost $85 million. Nothing! Not even the fence there anymore. The green fence. It's gone. You know, we have an opportunity to continue to deliver for ordinary people. And I know I want us to remember, Madam Deputy Speaker, that when we are put on this world, on this earth, We must understand that we put on this earth to do good to other people. Stop being selfish and be selfless. We must appreciate, Madam Deputy Speaker, that always there will be people who are lesser, less fortunate than others. And they need a hand up not a handout, but a hand up. Madam Deputy Speaker, we are told, and I believe, that if we have the world's goods, we are the government. Even the education in your head is the world's goods, because when you're dead, it's gone. Your body goes down, the spirit goes back. No more war between your spirit and your flesh. If you have the world's goods and sees your brother in need, you're supposed to show compassion on your brother, otherwise God love don't abide in you. That is what we are called. On this earth, it's not about you. Let go that ego. You are here, whether it's money or education or you have the world's goods, it is for the support and help of your brother who is in need. That is why when you hear me talking about universal health, brothers and sisters will be in need. And we are in the position to harness the world's goods, to pool the resources, so that those in need will benefit from our help. From all of our help. And we would have lived up to the charge if you have the world's goods and sees your brother in need. 
Show compassion on your brother. Otherwise God's love don't abide in you. Unless you believe it's my words, read your Bible. First John 3 and verse 17. And it goes on in verse 18 to say, My little children, you do so not only in word, but in truth and in deed. In doing, not just talking. I've lived my life that way. To be doing things. It is why I feel proud about the housing program which I manage. It's why I feel proud about the, the, um, the solid waste and how they're doing the work. We do it indeed. Not in word. May it please you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I do support the budget fully. Thank you, Honorable Member for St. Christopher, number eight. The House now stands adjourned until 2 p.m. And they don't care about trouble, but tell them, don't bother with me. It's a different thing, 1963, because the road is war on animal. Once I've lost so much of joy, and I have to say, any steel band man, only venture to break his band, is a law to the run, to the run, to the run. Ah, I get information about this situation. They tell me Tokyo is a danger with Desperado. They even call Sun Valley, Trinidad, all stars and Tripoli. They could play the mass as long as they go tackle the way.